All right, we are right at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome to all of our attendees on the line. Thank you so much for joining today's Hackett webcast, sharing the digital transformation journey at Intel Finance Enterprise Services. I do see a pretty steady stream of attendees dialing in, so we're going to go ahead and start with some housekeeping and some introductions while everyone gets settled. First and foremost, we are recording today's session, so all of our attendee lines have been muted to ensure that call quality. If you do have any questions for our panelists today, you can submit those via the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Or if you need any technical support, you can reach out to myself, the host, using the chat functionality, also located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are going to keep an eye on those Q&As. Uh, we will plan to address those at the end of our session during some dedicated Q&A time, uh, time permitting. Though anything we're not able to answer live, we will respond to offline after our session is concluded. And if you'd like to view today's presentation in full screen mode, you can do so by clicking in the, arrow, the arrows of the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. We have a rich calendar of upcoming webcasts currently posted to the Hackett Member Center portal. Over the coming months, we're going to be featuring presenters like 3M, uh, IBM, and many others. And we'll be covering topics like thriving in the emerging hybrid workplace, um, as well as sharing insights from our 2022 GBS performance study. So these sessions are open for registration. So do feel free to jump into the Member Center and register for any that pique your interest. And if you have a success story from your organization that you'd like to share with membership by presenting on a Hackett webcast, we would love to discuss that opportunity with you. I've included some information here on the benefits and the responsibilities of being a Hackett presenter. If this is an opportunity that you'd like to explore, uh, please do reach out to your Hackett account manager and they'll be happy to discuss it with you. Today's webcast is eligible for CPE credit. To receive CP credit, you are required to be on the line for at least 50 minutes. You'll also need to participate in our polling questions, as well as complete the evaluation survey that's going to pop up in your browser after our session concludes. We're also going to send that CPE survey link via email as well, so not to worry if you have a pop-up blocker in place, you'll get it two different ways. Uh, however, all that said, uh, even if you're not attending today's session to receive CPE credit, we do encourage everybody to complete that survey. Uh, it's very quick and it does help us to continuously improve our webcast. <clears throat> Today's learning objectives are to define why it's important for Intel to focus on digital transformation, to identify the importance of Intel finance enterprise services investments for digital, and to understand the results of the Intel transformation journey to date and what's coming. But before we get started with today's session, uh, we are going to um, get a quick pulse from our attendees on the line with a polling question. So we'd like to know from you, is your GBS organization certified by any of the following organizations? We've got a few options listed here. Um, there's also an option if you don't know, or maybe you don't use something like this. I'm going to leave the poll open for about 30 seconds while our attendees submit their responses. Just a few people wrapping up. Give it about five more seconds. All right, the poll is now closed. Penny, you should see the results. Okay, well, thank you, Julie, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a special polling. We've started to add this feature in our uh, webcast, so thank you for participating. We appreciate that. I'm honored today because we're excited to have with us today our speaker from Intel, but we also want to recognize the strong relationship that we have with the Cindy organization. So to, to, for today's um, introduction, we've asked Eric Mora to provide us with an introduction. And Eric has an extensive background and he is a specialist in the services sector within the Cindy organization. So welcome, Eric, and thank you for uh, helping us with today's speaker. Perfect. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Julian. Thanks to the Hackett Group for hosting today's uh, webinar uh, with us and for all the 
the support that uh, you have granted us in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm Eric Mora, I'm the investment specialist for the services sector at CINDE, the investment promotion agency of Costa Rica. Uh, we're a private non for profit organization taxed with supporting foreign companies that are looking into uh, having operations out of Costa Rica. We have over 40 years of experience working with more than 300 multinational uh, companies from different strategic sectors, such as corporate and digital services, advanced manufacturing, and life sciences. And uh, we're currently the number one investment promotion that you see worldwide, according to the International Trade Center, something that we're very proud of. And we continue to work to improve uh, our services. So, so for today, I just wanted to uh, bring a couple of numbers just to give you an idea on how uh, foreign direct investment in Costa Rica continue to grow even during the challenges that the pandemic uh, presented. In 2021, we were able to support over 100 projects uh, with 32 new companies that trusted Costa Rica and its time, which is definitely our greatest asset. Uh, and we also supported more than 70 reinvestment projects. Overall, these projects created uh, around 2,000 uh, new jobs for, for the country. It was a very successful year driven mainly by the stability and the business continuity that we were able to offer uh, the company that are operating here uh, in Costa Rica. So if you're interested in learning uh, more about how your company could leverage Costa Rica uh, to support your growth, you can see our country information right now in the screen. So please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to, to help you. So with uh, that out of the way, I would like to introduce our main speaker for today, Mr. Ricardo Badillo. He's a system engineer with a specialization in digital business and a master degree in information and telecommunication systems. He's an expert in project management, Lean Six Sigma, Agile, and RPA implementation. He's currently the global business transformation director at Intel and uh, with more than 20 years experience in robotic process automation, transition and transformation and change management management. Prior to Intel, he also led digital transformation processes in companies uh, such as Western Union and IBM. Today, Ricardo will share with us uh, Intel's digital transformation uh, journey. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Ricardo, for your time, and the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everybody that is in the audience uh, definitely will try to spend uh, and definitely uh, try to make this time that you are investing here uh, as valuable as possible for, for your companies uh, or for the companies that you are representing. So please, let's go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I have the control. Okay, so the agenda uh, that I'm planning to share today uh, about the Intel uh, digital transformation story. Definitely, I will provide some more context on the shared services uh, status in Costa Rica. Uh, what is the scope of Intel Finance and the service center that we run in uh, Costa Rica and Malaysia? Um, how the digital transformation is enabling the finance enterprise services value. Uh, so FES, an acronym that we use to represent the shared service center, the global shared service center that we have at Intel in finance. Um, the three-year transformation evolution that we have uh, at Intel. Uh, what are, have been the latest, the last year results uh, that we achieve uh, executing business transformation in finance? Um, uh, I want to spend uh, a very important part, I think this is the most important part from my perspective, is our people, uh, which is definitely our asset and who definitely make things happen, right? And why, and the reason, and the main reason why we embark in digital transformation. Um, it, a little bit about the finance enterprise service business transformation organization, the transformation model that we have, and some lessons learned, right? And challenges that we have and next steps. So that is the agenda that I am planning to cover in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. So uh, complementing what Eric, I already, uh, already share, regarding Cinde uh, and Costa Rica's operation, just to give you a, a perspective on the service sector. Um, in the last 20, 25 years, uh, 
uh, Costa Rica has created more than 100,000 uh, jobs or uh, new employees uh, uh, jobs created in Costa Rica in the services industry only. That represents around more than uh, 200 companies that are located here or that have presence here in Costa Rica serving globally uh, to different companies or the different organizations. 60% um, of those companies are actually multifunctional, meaning that uh, they have uh, more than three services that are uh, uh, that are processing or uh, serving to other areas of uh, in the organizations located globally. Um, and from those 200 companies, uh, 12 of them actually are representing Fortune, Fortune 500 companies. You can see some of the logos or the companies that are represented uh, that have um, presence here in Costa Rica. And many of them are uh, categorized as global services, meaning that the scope that they have is not only local or regional, but global, uh, global presence. Um, definitely uh, providing services like supply chain, finance, uh, 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 human resources, uh, technology, contact center support, and some of them are also back office or PPOs, right? So just to give you a perspective how the service sector is uh, in Costa Rica. Um, before going to the shared services, uh, my intention here is to share how how is actually the heat map of the and the presence of the finance enterprise services in finance at Intel. So as you can see, some of the three core functions that we have is uh, areas in the core finance, like uh, finance operations, like spending, costs, revenue, controls, and capital. Um, the second one, uh, accounting, including end-to-end uh, uh, -end processes like record to report, quote to cash, procure to pay, treasury accounting, and external reporting. And the third pillar is other type of functions that actually uh, we have in, in, in finance, like treasury, tax, uh, internal audit, uh, systems, trade, and some other type of functions that actually we have in finance. In blue is actually uh, what we call the footprint of the finance enterprise services. Although we have persons in all those three, uh, three categories, uh, like core finance, accounting, and others, definitely we do have presence in different end-to-end -end processes that go ac globally across the uh, different business units that we have uh, at Intel. Uh, we also have co-located groups. Uh, in the different regions that we have in Costa Rica, in Malaysia as well, meaning that they are sit in, in the country, but definitely have a functional reporting or functional operation uh, to other organizations in other global or even to corporate uh, to corporate offices, right? So um, those are the, uh, just to give you a perspective, what is the scope of the a service center and a scope of finance at Intel. The next slide is uh, going deeper, a little bit in what the Intel Finance Enterprise Services scope is. So right now we have around 400 plus uh, professionals that are located in Costa Rica and Malaysia, serving different type of functions, different type of uh, processes. Um, and the evolution of that journey goes back to more than 18 years ago, right? It started actually in Malaysia uh, uh, with some services, uh, specifically in the accounting side, then it came to Costa Rica. And as probably is a similar journey that all different shared services have, it, it, go, it went um, uh, smoothly, uh, taking and gaining trust from the different functions and corporate and taking more scope uh, along the way, right? Uh, today, we are 400 employees that are located globally and all of them actually serve 
global processes that you can see on the right. Uh, a lot of it, or most of them are in record to report, the end-to-end uh, -end record to report processes. Some others are in financial planning and analysis. Others in governance and transformations and um, others in risk, treasury, and so on, right? Also important to say is that in that journey that <clears throat> since 18 years ago uh, until now, the type of roles that have been transitioned or that have been trust to the enterprise services have been evolving as well not only in terms of the number of people that the enterprise services have achieved, but also the type of roles. If we go, uh, Intel has a very disciplined and a strong and mature structure of a business process management. And we do have representations from BPOs, global BPOs that are uh, actually sit in the finance enterprise services, meaning that the main scope is in the enterprise services uh, and other roles uh, uh, below the BPOs like uh, level ones, level twos that are actually leadership roles in the different end-to-end -end processes, right? So different business units supporting, of course, into some manufacturing company with presence in different regions, different countries, and different type of business as well, right? Uh, so that is uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to share in terms of the scope and type of services that we deliver. So we have a polling question, which says, uh, which, is the, which statement best describes your GBS digital transformation objective? If you can please go ahead and answer or take your question. Let's give uh, 30 seconds for the poll and then we will continue. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, yep, we'll give it about 30 more seconds. And as a reminder, for those of you on the line hoping to receive CPE credit for attending today's session, participation in the polling questions is a requirement. So please do submit your answers. Looks like we've got a handful wrapping up. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. All right, just a few left. Poll is now closed. You should see the results. Hey, well, thank you uh, for participating in the poll. It looks like we're we're actually tied with the um, C and D answers. So uh, having a clear understanding of change management and is not necessarily the issue. We're moving forward to looking at the um, attributes of digital automation and and what that might take within your organization. So this is a nice tee up, I think, Ricardo, to your comments on the next pages. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is very aligned to what our experiences and also challenges have been definitely by running digital transformation. Change management is the number one priority and number one item that we need to consider and, and continually evolve in order to definitely make sure that uh, changes, uh, changes something that impact people, impact processes, impact organizations, and definitely at the end of the day, impact the business, right? So definitely, uh, happy to continue uh, learning about your experiences as well. But I think we are pretty in sync on what your experiences in terms of what is the, uh, what reflects your priority and the digital transformation journey as well. Thank you, Penny. <clears throat> okay, so let's move forward. Uh, you might be familiar with this chart. It comes from Garner. And this is something that we continuously use in order at the enterprise services to evaluate what is the level of maturity or progression that we have had in terms of how do we move and typically, right, uh, moving, and I think um, not today, but uh, since many years ago, 
shared services had that, uh, that objective, that ambition, that definitely we, we, we are not a, a cost reduction, uh, cost reduction uh, center anymore, but we need to definitely identify those opportunities to continue generating value and not only generating value, but preserving that value, right? So in that uh, three level maturity uh, maturity uh, pyramid that we see here, usually when shared services start in the lower level of maturity, they continue to focus on reliability, right? Uh, the value added continue to be on keeping, um, uh, uh, filling customer needs, right? Uh, competitive costs, cost reduction, quality, compliance, and effectiveness, right? Of the different processes that we uh, we deliver to our organizations. The second step, right? The second escalon is simplification. How to move from uh, processes that probably are not standard or not harmonized to more harmonized, simplified, and standardized processes. Moving from, uh, uh, and definitely uh, providing or bringing efficiency, scope and expansion, we, we call it scaling, and definitely uh, that uh, reducing that friction that we might have in the different processes. So definitely uh, improving the customer experience in the processes that we deliver. And finally, the vision or the objective, the aspiration is to go to the next level, which is the insights, right? Is the top level of maturity where definitely the shared services will add value through insights, right? Anal uh, analyzing data and definitely impacting or influencing decisions that actually the business areas will do regarding uh, financial impact, financial uh, performance, like uh, not only cost, but also revenue and definitely other type of uh, financial benefits, right? So we are, where we are definitely probably is in the, in the second, uh, second step and beyond simplifications and definitely doing some, uh, some steps, right? Some small steps in terms of the insights and how we can definitely provide that uh, increasing value to the organizations through data analytics and, um, and increasing Okay, uh, that is the general general assessment or general maturity. Um, here is a perspective of the three-year transformation evolution that we set a couple of years ago, and as I mentioned, probably link it to the to the previous slide. The first thing that we wanted to focus during uh, a couple of years ago was we need to build a model that move from the basic cost reduction and efficiencies and effectiveness to value creation, right? Value generation and value capture. And value uh, definitely translated to not only efficiencies, but uh, what is the type of value that we can bring through transformation, meaning, a compliance, meaning a cost of quality, meaning risk reduction, meaning business impact that we have, our revenue generation that we have in the different areas. Uh, also, uh, we, we move, uh, specifically talking about uh, automation. We started three years ago, an initiative to implement uh, and deploy and use the different uh, uh, trending technologies like RDA, RPA, and analytics. Uh, but quickly, we, we understood that it was not enough to implement for the shared services, for the, for the processes that are delivered in the, from the uh, shared service center, but actually it could become a service as such. Uh, definitely providing that uh, automation as a service uh, to other areas in finance that probably didn't have the capability, didn't have the skill set or the knowledge to do it. So that evolution was very quick, actually, in the uh, first one or two years. Uh, the next step was moving also in that path to continue looking for that uh, vision of insights, invest in, in our people uh, and definitely upskilling 
uh, or talent to, uh, to learn more about analytics, advanced analytics, uh, uh, and moving from the uh, uh, descriptive, right, to a more predictive and prescriptive analytics models, right? So not only about reporting, not only about uh, dashboarding, but how we actually build models that help make or predict even uh, better decisions in the future, right? Um, similar to automation as a service, BPM and Lean Six Sigma in terms of process improvement are disciplines that are very strong in the shared services. Very quickly, we learned that it was an opportunity for us to actually uh, deliver those uh, that not, first of all, share that knowledge and also guide other areas in the organizations in finance that had not been so mature or had not been so fast to actually implement Lean uh, and Six Sigma then, uh, inside the organization to other areas. So next steps is continue looking for uh, cognitive, definitely leveraging new technologies uh, uh, like uh, new automation capabilities, process mining, or OCR that we can definitely implement in the different transactional processes. And the uh, uh, probably related in that progression in the advanced analytics is how do we identify those use cases for machine learning and artificial intelligence practice, right? So how do we evolve there? Uh, so that, that is a, a very simple view of our three-year transformation journey that we plan for the And we're in the middle right now, really executing that plan in, in 22. Okay. <clears throat> we have another poll which is what are the main contributions expected from the digital transformation in your GBS within the next two to three years? Please go ahead. You can choose multiple answers from the poll. Penny? Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, yep, we will leave this multiple choice poll question open for about 30 more seconds. Um, are your main contributors efficiency, effectiveness, experience, profitability, capability, agility, or maybe you don't know or you're not sure? And this is always interesting to me because what we've seen, you know, from the last 10 to 15 years, a huge focus on efficiency and effectiveness, quality, um, value of streams, just focused on those two core items. Uh, experience, we've seen a big uptick in the last few years. So it'll be interesting to see to what extent uh, the audience responds today. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. So efficiency and effectiveness, still top of the heap, uh, mm -hmm. followed by uh, agility. So the ability to adapt quickly to business change in the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, very mm -hmm. nice to see. And, and even experience that is absolutely something that's growing in attention so i think the audience is going to be ex excited ricardo when they see some of your successes and in, in all of these capabilities so congratulations and thanks for participating in the poll thank you yeah agree and and it is again it is very consistent to our experience and i think it's not only uh, intel's experience but uh, our peers or companies that are have uh, global business services uh, operations definitely i think the the first card that uh, or the first value that uh, that uh, we provide it starts with efficiency is effectiveness right but uh, quickly after you mature and you continue to drive those efficiencies is how what is the next step, right? What is the next evolution in terms of value? Uh, definitely agility. Well, uh, you could imagine how we move, and that is probably a side note in terms of experience, how we move a company and, or uh, a process that before pandemic, as an example, was uh, had, didn't have an experience to do it remotely, to actually adapt in the first quarter of the pandemic and definitely run the first uh, uh, close 
uh, remotely with people uh, with uh, the computers in and internet in their homes and so on, right? When work from home. So it's just one example of many others where we, uh, I agree, I think agility, the constant change definitely uh, uh, pushes to definitely uh, re uh, react and definitely proactively see what things we need to continue adapting and definitely moving to towards that change. Okay, let's move forward. Um, this is a very uh, very simple picture of um, what is the summary of the business transformation results of the finance enterprise services during twenty one. And as you can see in the top of, of the page, the main, uh, again, uh, the fact that we continue evolving in terms of the value that we deliver, it doesn't mean that we don't continue focus on efficiencies and effectiveness. That is a given. That is a given that will continue happening. But then we continue adding, well, what, what are the other type of benefits that we can bring Right, that uh, be a uh, digital transformation, like a cash savings, like a risk reduction, like employee satisfaction, um, like customer satisfaction. Right, so uh, different projects and different programs that, at the end of the day, uh, uh, have a benefit, uh, benefit, have benefits, tangible benefits, and also intangible benefits, right? And intangible that at the end of the day could translate definitely uh, uh, in, in uh, intangible benefits like uh, employee satisfaction, right? How much uh, 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 one percent of uh, attrition actually costs? How much of a uh, 1% of a customer satisfaction costs. So those are the type of benefits that we are actually bringing via digital transformation. And you will see, I will continue um, speaking in the next slides as well. It, basically business transformation and digital transformation uh, starts uh, or include these three main uh, pillars or disciplines, right? Uh, starts with the process, which is operational excellence, right? Uh, we move then to automation and then to data analytics. In the operational excellence uh, pillar or, or vector, we do have um, support or the programs that we are running or executing include a business process management adoption, right? Lean management system uh, deployment in the different processes. And again, as I mentioned in the three-year journey, it's not only for the FES, or for the shared service center, but actually for other areas in finance, quality management and change management, right? In terms of automation, we have definitely a goal, uh, move uh, from workflow automation, uh, deployment of uh, RDA, RPA, uh, robotic desktop automation, robotic process automation, and uh, data blending, right? And we are uh, definitely running some POCs in terms of process mining as well. And in terms of data analytics, as I mentioned as well, that evolution from descriptive the descriptive analytics like reporting dashboarding to more predictive and prescriptive analytics, right? So these are some of the results that, uh, and of course we measure that in terms of efficiencies, there's always going to be that component, but also other type of benefits that we bring, right? In terms of risk reduction, cost savings, cost of quality, quality, uh, customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction. Very well. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned in the agenda, this is one of the, if we couldn't do what I mentioned if we don't focus on our people. The, our people is our main asset, right? And we, part of the strategy of the digital transformation is, yes, we want business results. We want better processes. We want definitely risk reduction. We want efficiencies, but, the only way how we can achieve that bold result is going to be to leverage and enabling 
the existing organization, those 400 people that we have in the uh, shared service center to actually proactively do and identify the opportunities that they have in the day-to-day uh, -day job, right? How do they improve uh, their own work or their own organization's work, their own team's work or their own group work? So uh, how do they improve processes? How do they automate processes? Or how do they identify opportunities to provide insights through those processes? So this is a, a picture of how we enable the organizations through upskilling in different type of disciplines, starting from the basic BPM and, and Lean Six Sigma practices to project management, to automation, and also to uh, business intelligence and insights, right? So we have an uh, internal program. Uh, some of them definitely is a combination of internal and external programs that combine help us to build that upskilling strategy in order to have the talent ready to continue working in that digital transformation. At, at the end, one of the objectives that we have or that we want is digital transformation is not a program or shouldn't be a program, right? Or it starts as a program, but definitely it should become the cultural change that any, any employee should have in their hands. So we provide the tools, we provide the training and the knowledge, not only for them to definitely evolve in their career experience, but also to actually deliver those benefits and that value that we want for our customers, right? In the middle, we cannot discard that. Definitely, we need to continue monitoring that experience. We need to continue adapting to the new normal. I already shared some of those, right? Full year close forecasting, uh, close and forecasting, for example, 100% remote before pandemic didn't, everything was on site, right? Um, uh, we have definitely a dental, some values. We monitor whether the, the values, uh, while we continue to uh, upskill our talent in the technical disciplines, definitely we don't lose that side from the uh, major values that we have, and definitely continue moving through uh, analytics and risk reduction. Okay. As I mentioned, the, uh, the value uh, that we provide through business transformation is based in these three main pillars already. Um, operational excellence, including uh, BPM adoption, Lean Six Sigma quality management. Automation is business-led multi-platform process automation. And by business-led, meaning we empower, right? Right. And in the technologies that I mentioned before. So it is a combination of those enterprise-led uh, automation that uh, come from uh, uh, global initiatives, but also that bottoms up innovation uh, that comes actually from the day-to-day uh, -day work. And data analytics, I already mentioned that, right? So uh, that, and our purpose is definitely to uh, continue being that business partner that generates value in the different areas and functions. How do we do that? Uh, this is a simple view. Again, focus on people, um, creating this citizen-led model, uh, upskilling, analysis and operational excellence, automation and data analytics methods and techniques. Focus on education, creating and updating those upskilling and development plans so that the finance analysts actually can uh, learn about all these technical and digital disciplines. And not only those citizen developers, but also the finance process owners that we have in our organization. Access to technology, enable um, technology and methods, I would say, is uh, methods that are already available, operational excellence, uh, automation and analytics, the toolkit, that is available at Intel so that uh, uh, citizen developers can uh, definitely continue automating and running and creating 
those uh, type of digital uh, elements for their processes. Uh, of course, uh, enabling that partnership between finance and IT. Um, an operating model, as I mentioned, where we recognize that uh, we cannot depend on enterprise-led uh, initiatives or programs. Uh, we have uh, Intel and finance digital transformation initiatives that are overarching of many other uh, transformation and modernization programs, but we recognize that the bottoms up innovation where each employee is empowered to change the way they work is important in our model. The governance, of course, that um, centralized model where we identify and prioritize, of course, via change management, pipeline, security, compliance, standard reporting, and finally, value capture, right? How do we centralize that, that model in that combination? So those are the five elements that we consider are, uh, so far very important for the success of our digital transformation model. Well, we have another uh, poll. The question is, what do you consider is the main issue hindering your GBS in effectively adopting new technologies? You have one single And we're going uh, to force choice. them to one answer. So this mm -hmm. is a little tricky. You only get one answer. So you've got to think of the main issue. Mm -hmm. Lack of resources, skills, enterprise collaboration, risk aversion, lack of adequate knowledge. Mm -hmm. so we've got a handful of attendees just wrapping up the responses. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. Great. Poll is closed. You should see the results. Oh, interesting. Uh, lack of enterprise collaboration rated number one. Oh, no, it's tied with lack of resources. So mm -hmm. resources and collaboration followed up by skills. Any comments, Ricardo? Yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, enterprise collaboration. Uh, what I can understand is, the, so one of the, uh, I think all of us have faced those type of challenges, right? Uh, lack of resources, lack of enterprise collaboration. Um, for us, the key has been, number one is that, yes, we, in terms of enterprise collaboration, we need to look for those sponsors. We, leave, uh, we need to look for that partnership as an example between finance and IT. And in, even within finance, right? What are those, uh, those organizations that will continue driving or that are already driving a, a transformation? And at the end of the day, one of the initial questions is, what is the, what is the scope of the shared services and how the shared services or the service center will help you to actually transform your processes. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, those 400 people that are sit in the GBS and the, uh, the FES are the people that actually are doing the day-to-day -day job. So uh, we are, we know what needs to be changed. We actually suffer the pain point of what is not changing, right? Those processes that are not standardized, those processes that are not harmonized, or even those processes that are manual, repetitive. So uh, the change actually start from us, and then definitely we try to influence the organizations that we support, right? But at the end of the day, yes, that is a, a continuous challenge. And in terms of resources, uh, I think is it is aligned. Uh, resources are limited, but at the end of the day, that is, uh, it goes back to the sponsorship. How how digital transformation, business transformation, is a priority for the organization, and and what is the tone that leaders actually are setting in order to say, well, 
if we need to transform XYZ or the, the program or the uh, initiative, the transformation modernization initiative is going to do XYZ, we need to look for those resources. So uh, I think everything ends up in, we need to drive that sponsor and stakeholder uh, management. We need to drive change. We need to communicate and definitely we need to support, right? We need to have that empowerment in the organizations to continue driving that change and transformation. Yep. But, but very aligned and agree with the, some of the challenges that we, we usually have. Okay, I think uh, this is the uh, one of the last slides uh, before the next step. So lessons learned and challenges. Um, I, I already mentioned something about that, right? So digital transformation needs to move from an enterprise program to a cultural change where and, and I probably is tied to the second option that we saw on the poll is we need to empower finance employees. The transformation is not going to come only bottoms up, right? In a program that's going to drive change, that is going to change or implement a specific technology or implement a specific system, but, uh, right? It's going to come from the people that actually do the work. Uh, if I am a person, a finance analyst that is doing the work and I feel stress, I feel that my work is bored, I'm going to identify first, what is the thing that I need to change? And some change, uh, by the way, some change start with, oh, I need to do this Excel macro first in order to improve the way I work, right? And probably you have the same experience. They start with the macro, then it becomes an RPA, then it becomes a Power BI report, then it becomes a solution, and then it works for everybody, right? So, and, and with this upskilling, that helps the, that machine, that uh, transformation machine to continue growing and evolving, right? So that bottoms up for me is definitely part of the success. Um, important, in this case, finance or any, any type of function, business function that is represented in the shared services, right? Cannot work alone. We need, IT is a super important, and technology is a super important, component in order to drive digital transformation. So that connection between the function and the IT uh, sponsorship and partnership, again, is key to drive that effective value uh, value delivery, right? Uh, I already mentioned combining that tops down enterprise led with bottoms up business led transformation initiatives and breaking paradigms by driving more agile digital transformation combining process and technology excellence, right? Uh, do we, uh, questions like, in order to transform something, do we need to have a complete end-to-end -end standard process, right? It's going to take probably years to get there. How do we combine? Yes, we need to do that in the long-term, but how do we combine with the short-term or low-hanging fruits that we can actually drive bottoms up as well? So very important that. Uh, finally, probably summarizing what, it, what is next for us is um, continue driving. I mentioned automation, I mentioned operational excellence, Lean Six Sigma, piloting scale up uh, transformation as a service, right? It started with automation, it started with Lean Six Sigma, how transformation actually becomes a service for finance, right? And there's a really, really great opportunity there. Number two, extend transformation governance to functional areas outside of finance enterprise services, right? That uh, if we are driving, if we are leading the way on how transformation should go, how do we expand that learning, right? And that experience to other areas that probably are a little bit uh, behind on that. And number three, drive workplace digitalization experiments, uh, testing cognitive machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Probably the experimentation, right, is that innovation part that definitely build that environment where risk can be taken, where issues might happen, but definitely uh, continue iterating and evolving in an agile manner. Right, so uh, testing those technologies, testing those methods, and definitely continue adding value. I think that is the 
last slide, yeah. So we, we, we complete the, the content with the next steps. And I think, not sure if um, we might have some time for Q&A, Jewel and Penny. Where yes, are... we do. We do? Okay. We do. Uh, okay, let's... Q &A. So we've got a couple mm -hmm. that have already come in. Um, to our attendees on the line, now would be the perfect time. If you have questions for our panelists today, you can go ahead and submit those via the Q&A functionality. Um, starting with what's already come in, we have a question from an attendee who asks, how is the FP&A transition of work from local finance to SSD handled, and how was it received by the organizations involved? Um, in, in, interesting, very very good question, and 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 I think it's um, I, I'm not sure. It, I don't think it's the the transition when we are talking about processes transition to the GBS. Uh, what I can share is that we have a standard framework through transition processes. And it's not specifically to a p &A, but it could work for any other, like accounting or other type of processes. Um, how, how does it work? Uh, so it has worked in, in, with two approaches. Usual, usually the natural, uh, uh, na natural approach, with, which is more organic, in terms of, oh, we already have some scope of the example of PNA processes, finance uh, uh, process and anal analysis. We have a scope or we are already serving one business unit. It is natural that if we are doing this type of processes, we can do this uh, other business unit or continue scaling organically, let's say, right? And it, that has been more, um, uh, probably a reactive, right? Uh, but the other one is more proactive, meaning, uh, and that happened last year, we wanted to, to one of the poll questions that enterprise sponsorship. We wanted the scaling to definitely, a, or the transition to be sponsored by CFO. So, uh, and the, definitely the result was so, so much different. Uh, in terms of the speed of the uh, process transition from uh, corporate or, or business to the SSE. How it has worked, uh, I think it's, uh, it's challenging. I don't think anybody, uh, we can recognize that it is difficult to drive that change, it's difficult to get that alignment in terms of partnership uh, that we need to have in, in the leaders in order to see the benefits. But how it we have done is definitely demonstrated with facts what has happened in the past, right? So uh, what are the results? What is the quality? What is the efficiencies that we're driving? What is the employee? satisfaction that we got, what is the customer satisfaction that we got, and definitely that has helped uh, progressively to gain trust and definitely open for people or leaders to definitely uh, be more assertive in order to move those processes to the to the SSE. And the framework, the how definitely is uh, uh, use, uh, probably the, the, the uh, the, the simple is the lift and shift, right? Go to the process, uh, take the process and then standardize, automate and definitely improve. Okay. Great. Um, had a couple questions here, wanting to understand more about your experience with talent, uh, specifically some lessons learned in relation to employee turnover. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I can share that Right now, the turnover is between eight to nine percent uh, turnover, which is considered relatively low, and it is challenging, uh, and especially in finance and probably in other functions as well, how to actually uh, continue retain our talent. And also, if you see uh, Costa Rica is also challenging, as you see 200 companies are looking for the, probably the same type of talents, the same type of skills. It is uh, a very dynamic uh, environment. So how do we do that? 
uh, we have a very, very strong strategy in terms of talent retention, talent uh, uh, satisfaction. Um, we have different elements that come from corporate, like uh, employee satisfaction, um, uh, but also we have local initiatives that actually are very, very custom made regarding the market that we live on. And then um, I think one of the elements, um, specifically from the digital transformation perspective, as I mentioned, upskilling is one of the major, I, I, I consider is one of the retention factors for talent. So who in accounting, or FP&A doesn't want to actually, yeah, continue doing what they were actually, what they study or what their profession is, but how do they actually continue evolving in those skills to more digital capabilities? So the digital upskilling is one of the integral parts of that talent retention and many other things, right? Retention, customer satisfaction, uh, employee satisfaction, um, uh, leadership, right? A leadership uh, development as well and growth, right? Uh, everybody or anybody wants to have opportunities to grow and in this changing environment, actually uh, uh, the way how we coordinate that is, is important. Some of the elements. Great. Uh, in a similar vein, another attendee also touched on upskilling and was curious specifically to understand how have you maintained continuity in the solutions developed when the backfills during the Great Resignation may not yet be upskilled? Uh, let me understand the question. How do, uh, can you repeat, please, Julia? The question reads, how has Intel managed investing in its employees by upskilling in an environment with high turnover, example, uh -huh. the Great Resignation, and how have you maintained continuity in the solutions developed when the backfill may not be upskilled yet? Right, uh, good, very good question. So uh, it is interesting, um, but uh, at least in the shared services, and I know that the phenomenon of uh, the great resignation has been especially impacting US, right? Or uh, yes, US. Um, uh, specifically in the shared services, we have not necessarily seen that uh, material impact in great turnover. That is why, uh, as mentioned probably, and I'm not sure if, what is your experience in your company or uh, in other companies, but uh, the, 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 the uh, attrition rate that we've had in the last three years has been very steady. So uh, uh, we haven't had that phenomenon uh, as a context. Now, Moving to the second part of the question, how do we manage that upskilling and people actually building those uh, those artifacts in automation analytics and what happens? Because even with or without um, uh, that great resignations, it, it is a fact that a person can rotate and actually we motivate that. A person can rotate to other organization and eventually could uh, go out of Intel as well. But how do we manage that? Definitely when we go through this citizen development program, not only uh, and in the elements of governance, we have a very strong procedure where for a citizen develop, when a citizen develop actually release a specific feature, that feature needs to have some elements of Number one, documentation, documentation in order to operate. Number two, definitely that one or two backups that could actually run and execute that. And number three, the sustaining you mentioned. What happens with that artifact that is there? So not only as an example, my team support that governance, but also support the knowledge that those specific employees have. So eventually we can sit there. So if there is a complete structure in order to uh, keep the lights on and continue supporting and sustaining those specific artifacts. Mm -hmm. Right. We have time for one more question, and we've got a ton of great questions here in the queue. So for those of you that we won't get to live, um, we are going to be answering questions offline and follow up. Um, but we'll get to one last before we wrap up. Um, Ricardo, an attendee asks, can you talk about your data foundation and any required initiatives, um, any required initiatives required to provide centralized data for many ERPs or other systems? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So there, effectively, there is a central uh, data analytic center of excellence in finance that is in charge of building these analytics and reporting models so they can be consumed by the finance organization, right? So uh, that is a complete strategy uh, where, uh, and it's not specifically in the shared service center, but it's more broader or is a corporate finance strategy. And that actually, that center of excellence serve different functions, including the SSC. So uh, pretty much for that, we are consumers of those specific models. And the objective of that organization is to continue uh, build, uh, number one, building those models, number two, maintaining uh, those models, and number three is evolving those models with the new requirements that the different areas have. So uh, in terms of data strategy, we have a centralized governance, we have a centralized architecture, and um, those are the, th that is the organization that actually is in charge of uh, making sure that uh, data flows from or from or to the ERP from the different other type of systems and, and, and technology footprint that we have at the Intel and specifically that we work in finance. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you so much to our attendees for the participation and the questions. These are great. Um, we will, of course, follow up on those that we couldn't get to live. Um, we are right at the top of our hour for today's session. Um, Ricardo, thank you so much for joining. Penny, any closing remarks before we wrap today's webcast? Yeah, thank oh. you. A huge appreciation, Ricardo. We really appreciate your open, candid insights, the flow and what you've achieved. Um, congratulations on getting your 2020 Hackett top quartile recognition. I know you didn't promote that, but I will give you that. Uh, and Eric, thank you for bringing Ricardo to us on behalf of the whole Cindy organization. Exceptionally well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. For, mm -hmm, just for those that, uh, if they submitted some questions, uh, feel free to contact me um, in LinkedIn and uh, you have my email address as well that was presented in this presentation. Feel free to, to send me an email and I will be happy to respond as well. Thank you. For myself. Thanks, Ricardo. And thank you so much to our attendees for joining today's Hackett webcast. As a reminder, when you exit out of the Zoom, that CPE evaluation survey should pop up in your browser. Um, if it does not, we will also be sending it to you via email. So not to worry, you'll get it in two different forms. Um, again, we do encourage everybody to provide feedback, but this evaluation is a requirement if you're looking to receive CPE credit. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. This does conclude today's Hackett webcast.